is this this man who is pummeling this other Never met the man in my entire life. Well, you're an all-state champion. How do you stay in shape these days? I like to cook Italian. Well, how can that I, be healthy um, for you? Well, let me get this through your head in a very gentle way. In the name of Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Welcome, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to this program entitled Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. On this 17th day of July in the year of our Lord, 2021, I would like to go back to the well, that is, to the powerful meditation dictated by our Lord to the servant of God, Luisa Picareta. At this 12 o'clock hour, well, Eastern time, of course, I would like to recall the first hour of the agony in the garden, or rather, the first hour of the agony on the cross of our Lord, where he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Now, I chose to present this hour to you, not only because it's the hour where I am, but it is very apropos of the times in which we are living. The Church is going through a second Calvary of sorts in these end times in which we live, through the members of the body of Christ. You are going through a Calvary. Of course, there is a um, lockdown now going on in Asia due to a second wave, as they call it, of the pandemic, and therefore, the churches are closed throughout Sydney, throughout other cities, some parts of Victoria and Australia and elsewhere. And this movement is moving toward us, where our churches also may experience closure again. And this causes our Lord intense suffering through us. And the Lord says, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Now, certainly, there are people who deliberately do bad, and they know what they're doing. They, they, they enter into a pact with evil and with the prince of evil. And then there are those who unknowingly concur in these evildoers' actions. Now, behind the curtain... Only God sees what's going on. Only God can judge the motives of the heart and the intentions thereof. But we caught up in this crossfire, in this war zone, endure the effects of evil. And the Lord reminds us that at this 12 p.m. hour, God avails himself of all things for those who love him. Well, for those who consecrate themselves to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Louisa too experienced what Jesus experienced on the inside. And this is what I would like to share with you. The interiority of the soul of Christ manifest in Louisa's sentiments, where she says, My crucified love. I see you on the cross as on the throne of your triumph, in the act of conquering all things and all hearts, and drawing them so closely to yourself that all may experience your superhuman power. Nature is horrified at such a great crime and prostrates itself before you. It awaits in silence a word from you to pay you homage and make your dominion known. The sun, unable to sustain such an overwhelming sorrowful sight of you, weeps and withdraws its light. 
Hell is terrified and waits in silence. And all creation is hushed in silence. Your sorrowful mother and your faithful ones remain utterly speechless. Petrified at the sight of your torn and dislocated body, they behold you in agony and silently await a word from you. Your body hangs silently in an ocean of the pain of such agonizing and harrowing convulsions that the soldiers fear you might die with your next breath. What is more, everyone is speechless and hushed in silence, even the obstinate Jews and the ruthless executioners who, until a little while ago, were offending you, mocking you, and calling you an imposter and a criminal. And the thieves who blasphemed you. Remorse enters them, such that if they try to insult you, their words die on their lips. Here we have a depiction of Christ surrounded by the majority of jeerers, mockers, and just the minority of supporters. And the wizard refers to thieves on each side of Christ blaspheming him. And this is consistent with Luke 23, 39, where he says that the criminals... And the Greek word for criminals that Luke uses is kakurioi, who were crucified together with Jesus, only one of the blasphemers, only one of whom blasphemes him, while the other reproves the blasphemer. Now, Matthew, on the other hand, unlike Luke 23, Matthew 27 and Mark 15 report two thieves, and they use a different word. Unlike Luke's word criminal, Matthew and Mark use the word thieves. Lustis, who were crucified with Jesus, both of whom blaspheme him. Both of whom. See? Luke says one blasphemes, Matthew and Mark say they both blaspheme the Lord. Although Matthew suggests that both thieves were crucified immediately after Jesus, Louise's explanation is consistent with all gospel writers. Namely, the two criminals were thieves who blasphemed Jesus, the second of which, which we call the good thief, after blaspheming him, has a conversion of heart and later repents and rebukes the first blasphemer. And this conversion of the good thief represents many of us in some ways, where we, after having heard our Lord in one way or another, turn around and ask forgiveness. And what does the Lord do? He doesn't say, I told you so. Rather, he willingly and silently, with open arms, receives our remorse. And the wizard tells us that she penetrates into Jesus' interior when she says, as my soul penetrates your interior, Jesus, I see that your love overflows, it suffocates you, and your humanity cannot contain it. Compelled by your love that torments you more than the pains themselves you experience, with a strong and moving voice you speak as the God you are. You raise your dying eyes to heaven and exclaim, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And again you become silent, immersed in unheard of pains. Crucify Jesus, how can so much love be possible? After so many pains and insults, your first word is of forgiveness. And you excuse us before the Father for so many sins. Now, This ought to be the virtue, that is, the virtue of mercy we cultivate in these end times, where there is so much evil around us, deliberate or indeliberate, 
does not matter. Not to those who are Christians. What matters is that they convert through the prayers and sacrifices we offer. Naturally, we all need to convert as well. We're no saints in the absolute sense of the word. We are all wayfarers on our journey toward perfection. Till the last breath we draw, we are imperfect. And only God can make us perfect in this life and or in the next. But we cannot do it. So the prayer that we say for others, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do, should be also in some respects directed toward us for our shortcomings. You are the first to offer forgiveness, Louisa says to Jesus, as you make the first word descend into each heart that has sinned. But how many reject it and do not accept your forgiveness? Your love is then taken by folly as with uncalculated excess, and you beg forgiveness for all and insist on giving to all the kiss of peace. At this word, hell trembles and recognizes you as God. Nature and everyone remain astonished. Now, when this expression of Louisa, hell trembles and recognizes you as God, she reveals to us that up until now, Satan and many demons in hell with him did not know that Jesus was God. And this is consistent with the approved writings of of, um, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich and the writings of other saints approved by the Church. That Satan, from Satan, was withheld the knowledge that he was God. Satan knew that Jesus was someone who would wreak havoc to his kingdom. But God did not give Satan all the knowledge that Jesus not only was God, but that his mission was not to simply wreak havoc to the kingdom of hell, but utterly undo it. Now, some people may take exception to this teaching. But before I address that, Let me reveal to you what Jesus tells Louisa. He tells Louisa, my daughter, the enemy had an inkling of your mission. He knew that I would use you in some way for my great glory and that he would in turn receive a great defeat, unlike any defeat he had ever received before. Moreover, because he had this insight, despite his great efforts, he could not make any affection or thought less than pure penetrate you. As I closed off to him any access to you, and seeing that he had no way of entering you, he grew enraged and unable to do anything set out to terrify you with nightmares of fear and fright. Furthermore, since he could not understand the reason for my great designs over you, which would ultimately serve for the destruction of his kingdom, Satan attentively sought out the cause, hoping to be able to harm you in some other way. Now, this passage taken from Louisa's memoirs reveals to us that God gave Satan an inkling of the knowledge of Louisa's mission without giving her the full him the full knowledge of her mission. The same thing applies to Christ. God the Father gave to Lucifer, now Satan, fallen angel, some knowledge that God would wreak havoc to his kingdom, the kingdom of hell, but did not give Satan all the knowledge of who God was in the human person of Christ, sorry, in the divine person of Christ, human nature of Christ. And with that little knowledge, Satan sought out to tempt him, and try to make him fall, hence Jesus testing in the desert for three times for 40 days. And in the 12 p.m. hour, we are reminded that, in the words of Louisa, 
Satan, all of hell, trembled and recognized Jesus as God in this moment where he's on the cross. So now God reveals to Satan, after Christ has been persecuted, contradicted, accused of being a king, of not paying taxes, of blaspheming, calling himself the Son of God, of being scourged, crowned with thorns, mocked, jeered, and nailed to a cross and crucified <clears throat> that he is God. And everything remains hushed in silence at this revelation of God to all creation, not just to Satan, that Jesus is God. So some people wonder if Jesus was not recognized by the demons as God, why did in the New Testament, when he cast them out, say, leave us alone, we know who you are, Jesus, Son of God. And the answer to this question is simple. The expression Son of God is used both in the Old and New Testament. If you recall those three people in the fiery furnace, right, with Daniel, there was a four that the king saw, and he said, he looks like a son of God. Or, Nathaniel in the New Testament is referred to as a son of God, and the list goes on. So the expression son of God does not necessarily mean that that person is God, but rather that that person has a special mission from above to do some great work. So the demons recognized that Jesus was commissioned for some great work that would wreak havoc to their kingdom, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they knew explicitly that he was God. Now they do while he's crucified on the cross. And Louisa says, Hell trembles and recognizes you as God. Nature and everyone remain astonished. They recognize your divinity and your unquenchable love. See, in this moment, all creation all creation, apart, of course, from the free human will of some people, recognize that Jesus is God and silently wait to see how far his love may go. And not only your voice, Louisa relates, but also your blood and your wounds cry out to every heart that has sinned, come into my arms, for I forgive you. My seal of forgiveness is purchased at the price of my blood. Oh, my beloved Jesus, repeat this word again to all sinners in the world. Entreat mercy for all and apply the infinite merits of your most precious blood to all. Oh, good Jesus, continue to appease the divine justice on everyone's behalf and concede your grace to those who, finding themselves in the act of having to forgive, do not find the strength to do so. O oh, my Jesus, adored and crucified, in these three hours of most bitter agony, long, you long to bring to completion the work of redemption. As you silently hang on the cross, I behold in your interior the desire to offer the Father satisfaction on everyone's behalf. You thank him and offer satisfaction on behalf of all. You implore forgiveness for all and beseech him for the grace that will keep them from ever offending you again. And in order to obtain this from the Father, you offer up your entire life. Recapitulating it, from the first moment of your conception to the, your last breath. Beloved Jesus, endless love, let me recapitulate your entire life with you along with our sorrowful mother, with St. John, and with the pious woman. And now in this moment, Louisa entreats the Lord as follows. Let us go through the life and pains of my sweet Jesus. And Jesus, I thank you on behalf of all for the many thorns that pierced your adorable head, for the drops of blood that flowed from it, 
from the blows you've received on it and for the hair they tore from it. I thank you on behalf of all for all the good you have done and obtained for all. For the enlightenment and good of inspirations you have given to all. For all the times you have forgiven all of our sins of thought, pride, conceit, and self-esteem. O oh, my Jesus, I ask your forgiveness in the name of all for all the times you have crowned, we have crowned you with thorns, for all the drops of blood we made you shed from your most sacred head, and for all the times we have not corresponded to your inspirations. For the sake of all these pains you endured, I ask you, O oh Jesus, to grant us the grace to never again commit sins through our thoughts. I also intend to offer you everything you suffered in your most sacred head, so as to offer you all the glory that souls would have given you had they made good use of their intellect. Now, my brothers and sisters in Christ, this prayer that I'm continuing to share with you from the Louisa in this 12 p.m. hour of the Passion, is something I encourage you to do in these end times. During the evils that we experience in these end times. Oh my Jesus, Louisa says, I adore your most sacred eyes. And I thank you for all the tears and the blood they have shed for the cruel piercing of the thorns, for the insults, derisions, and contempt you bore during your entire passion. I ask your forgiveness for all, for all those who use their sight to offend and insult you. And I ask you for the sake of the pain suffered in your most sacred eyes to grant us the grace to never again offend you with evil gazes. I also intend to offer you all that you yourself suffered in your most sacred eyes so as to give you all the glory that souls would have given you if their gazes were fixed only on heaven, on the divinity, and on you, O my Jesus. I adore your most sacred ears, and I thank you for all that you suffered on Calvary while the executioners deafened them with shouts and jeers. I ask your forgiveness in the name of all for all the evil conversations we have listened to. And I entreat you to open to your eternal truths and to the voices of grace the ears of all men, so that no one may offend you ever again with their sense of hearing. I also offer you all that you suffered in your most sacred ears, so as to give you all the glory that souls would have given you had they made holy use of this faculty. And Louisa goes on to make reparation <coughs> to Christ. In all the faculties his humanity engaged in, his sight, his hearing, his touch, his taste, etc. Et we ought to adopt this prayer too in these end times, which is a powerful prayer to make reparation on behalf of those who offend God. And with this halfway point, <clears throat> I wish to remind you all to continue to support with your prayers, Radio Maria, that provides you in these end times with good programming on the Catholic faith, on morals, on doctrine, on discipline, so that we may continue to offer you this commercial-free and listener-supported station along with its instructions on the Catholic faith.
Now, this was a brief reflection that I wanted to share with you in part from the 12 p.m. hour. This prayer of Louisa, who enters into the interiority of Christ in order to teach us how we ought to pray, to not only make reparation to him, but help convert hearts to him, even those who either deliberately or indeliberately offend him. Now, another theme I wanted to address that I touched upon in the previous segment was the ability of Jesus Christ to redo the acts of all souls, in particular, the poor actions of those done by humans. To better understand this reality of Christ, redoing the acts of all, we must first go back to the beginning, where it all began. And that is in Christ's human will. You see, Christ conceived before he redid all the acts of all humans, while yet in the womb of his mother Mary. I wish to share with you a passage of Mary and then of Christ on this reality. If you go to the Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will book, day one, Mary tells us, I was conceived without original sin. I was conceived holy and pure. And Mary glorified God for having conceived her in this way. In the never-ending light of the divine will she was conceived. But her conception was in view of Christ's conception. Mary was immaculately conceived for the purpose of conceiving immaculately God. Therefore, we find that Christ conceived within himself all beings, all humans. In order that he might redo their acts. Jesus conceived Mary and he conceived Louisa within him, self. In order that they might conceive him within themselves. This is found in volume 17, May 1st, 1925. where Jesus conceives all souls, and therefore Louisa does the same. Jesus tells Louisa on December 16th, 1922, in volume 15, as well as in volume 14, November 11th, 1922, that there is nothing, no great, no love, greatness, or power that can be compared to his conception. He states on, on December 16th, 1922, the divine power formed my ever so little humanity, so little as to be comparable to the size of a hazelnut. And as the word was conceived in it, the immensity of my will, enclosing all souls of the past, present, and future, conceived in my same will the lives of all souls. And as I developed, as my life grew, so did all lives develop and grow within me. Therefore, even though I appear to be alone, when observed through the microscope of my will, all souls can be conceived, can be seen conceived in me. Here Christ reveals to us that at the moment of his conception in the immaculate womb of Mary. In that instant, in the twinkling of an eye, by the power of the Holy Spirit and the will of the Father, all souls that would be born, all souls that were born, and all souls that were being born, 
or conceived in the will of Christ. Now, in order to understand how Christ can redo our acts, we must first understand where it all began. And it is right here. When he conceives all souls, and with all souls, all acts within his own will. But what does he say? As my life developed, so did all lives develop within me. You see? So this conception was instantaneous. That is the conception of all lives within Christ, all souls within Christ. But as he grew in age, wisdom and knowledge in his human nature, through his actions in the body, his acts of the soul, that is desires, prayers, sighs, intentions, so all acts of all souls, not only developed through him, through his works, thoughts, actions of the body and soul, but were divinized in and through him. This is a mystical reality that takes meditation, reflection, for us to fully assimilate. We cannot fully understand this invisible spiritual reality of Christ conceiving and developing within himself all the thoughts, words, actions, acts of all creatures without this reflection, without this meditation. You see, remember when Christ returned from the temple after he was missing for three days, what does the scripture relate? Mary, after finding him, pondered these things in her heart. She pondered them. What does that mean? If not... She reflected upon them, prayed over them. This reflection is essential to understanding the gift of living in the divine will. It's not just a matter of mathematics. A plus B equals C, or 1 plus 1 equals 2, or 1 plus 2 equals 3. It's rather knowing and applying it to reality. And that application to reality is reflection. Takes time, takes meditation. You see, if the incarnation of Christ enclosed and embraced within his humanity the lives of all creatures throughout his earthly existence, he progressively conceived their acts within his divine acts. By this means, Jesus enclosed and conceived all souls, divinized human nature, and reestablished in himself the operation of the Trinity as the principle of human activity. Consider, for example, the passage of May 1st, 1925, from volume 17, where Jesus relates, My humanity received from my divinity the mission of saving souls and the office of Redeemer. In its role of Redeemer, my humanity conceived all souls. Notice what he says. His humanity, not his divinity, his humanity conceived all souls. You see, the conception of souls happens in the human nature of Christ, in his will, his human will, which is inseparable, of course, from his divine nature and therefore his divine will. But nonetheless, This is where it all begins. The redoing of acts begins in the human will of Christ, the humanity of Christ. Why? Why not in his divine will? Well, for the same reason why Jesus could not bring about this gift through Mary, but through Louisa. He needs someone conceived in sin like us, not only conceived in sin like us, which is a person of Louisa, to bring this gift to us because she is like us but he also needs a human nature in order to redeem humanity. The sinless humanity of Christ was necessary to redeem the sinful human nature of all of us. And the sinful humanity of Louisa, conceived in sin, was necessary 
for sinful mankind to receive the primordial gift that our sinless parents enjoyed in the Garden of Eden. See, God, who is without sin, can repair for an infinite crime, the infinite crime of original sin. You see, any sin against God is infinite, because God is infinite. And no finite being, like Adam and Eve, who are created, can make up for that. So Christ, God himself, who was infinite, had to make reparation for an infinite offense. However, and that's the work of redemption, however, when it comes to the gift of living in the divine will, redemption is already done. The infinite offense is already repaired for in Christ. Now Christ can give us the second installment of this restitution of the primordial holiness of first parents enjoyed before sin. And this does not have to come through God, because God had already made up for that infinite offense through redemption in the person of Christ. But it comes through a creature conceived in sin, who's not making up for an infinite offense anymore. Christ did that. He is the sole redeemer. But is to embellish this tree of life that Christ rooted within the fertile soil of his humanity that now bears fruit and that could not bear fruit until the second installment was given through a creature conceived in sin like us, namely Louisa. So Christ, in redemption, plants this tree of life on the fertile soil of his unblemished humanity, in the unblemished soil of Eden, as it were, whereby the roots extend themselves, forming the sprout, the shoot, the bark, which extends its branches and leaves, but they cannot produce fruit until the second installment of holiness is actualized in the person of Luisa Picareta. Mary makes Christ's tree a reality by giving birth to this divine seed within her womb. In her, it spreads its roots, and it extends its branches to all of us, and f its leaves bud forth. But for the fruit to happen, God has to choose one from the same stock as us, conceived in sin like us. Because we are the fruit, and we cannot be grafted to these branches unless that divine humor running through the, bra the bark and the branches, that divine sap, as it were, flows within us. And what is this divine sap, this divine humor that flows through the bark and branches of this tree, sown in the fertile soil of Christ's humanity by virtue of the Virgin the Immaculate Conception of Mary and the Virgin Birth of Christ, if not the primordial holiness that our first parents enjoyed before sin. So Christ conceives within his humanity, his human will, all souls. But that's not enough for us to be grafted to this divine person of Christ. In addition to conceiving all lives and souls within his humanity in the womb of Mary, he must divinize them. And this is a progressive work that occurred throughout his human life. He divinized with every thought, word, and action of his, all thoughts, words, and actions of all humans throughout the course of 33 plus 9 months, 33 years plus 9 months. And this is revealed in volume 14, October 19th, 1922. And in so doing, reestablished in himself the operation of the Trinity in all human beings as the principle of all human activity. This is found in volume 35, October 3rd, 1937. You see, Jesus' divine acts 
or order to the divinization of human nature. This is how Christ redid within himself all acts of all humans. He conceived us at the moment of his conception in Mary's womb, and throughout those nine months in the womb of suffering, in darkness, of cons- being confined, constrained, within that small womb of Mary, and throughout the course of his 33 years of life, divinized every thought, word, and action of every human, within himself, you say, within himself, not within us. And it is now our role, our office on earth, to do what Christ did. That is, through our thoughts, words, and actions, and our human will, to conceive all lives of all beings and divinize them through the cooperation of our human will with God's divine will. For Jesus' divine acts were ordered to the divinization of human nature and to empowering souls to accomplish the same divine acts that he accomplished. See, when the soul encloses its acts within the acts of Jesus' humanity, they acquire a divine character. St. Hannibal de Francia writes, and this comes from the reflection of the hours of the Passion, the 6 p.m. hour reflection. Let us enclose our, all of our thoughts, affections, heartbeats, prayers, actions, meals, undertakings, and all other acts in the heart of Jesus as they are being done. In this way, our actions will acquire a divine character. But since it is difficult to always maintain this divine attitude because of the difficulty the soul faces in trying to make its actions immediate, that is, to continuously fuse them within Jesus, it can substitute the disposition of its goodwill with that of Jesus. Jesus will be very pleased by this. Unquote. So from the time of man's creation, the divine acts that God had prepared for all souls and that await their actualization in us were already present to Jesus, to the Son of God conceived in the womb of Mary. And their number was already established in Christ, the number of all the acts we are to perform. Let me read a few passages to drive this home more clearly. Volume 24, May 20th, 1928, Jesus Reveals. It behooves you to know that everything that has been determined by the Supreme Being. It behooves you to know that everything has been determined by the Supreme Being. Prayers, acts, pains, and sighs that the human creature must do in order to obtain what we desire to give it and for which it sighs. So if these acts are not accomplished, the longed-for Son of our divine will will not descend from us. Upon the long night of the human will to form the day of the kingdom of the divine fiat. This is why it often happens that many acts and prayers are done but nothing is obtained. And then, on account of one more little sigh in prayer, one obtains what he so much longed for. Was it perhaps on account of this last act that he obtained this grace? By no means. It was the continuation of all of one's acts and prayers. And if it appears that the grace we desire to give us, to give is obtained by the soul's last act, It is because that one act was needed to complete the number pre-established by us. And this teaching can also be found in volume 24, May 20th, 1928, and um, which I just quoted to you from, as well as from um, March 12th, 1930, from volume 28 as well. In this passage, Jesus tells Louisa, My daughter, our infinite wisdom, when it must give a blessing to the creature, does not count the time but the acts 
of the creature. Because before the divinity there exist neither days nor years, but one single unending day. And that is why we do not measure the time, but we count the acts the creature has accomplished. Indeed, in that time that to you seems so long, the acts that we wanted in order to come and redeem man had not yet been accomplished. For only acts determine the coming of a blessing, not time. Christ, therefore, in his 33 years plus nine months of existence on earth, accomplished every single act that was pre-established by the Father, the Heavenly Father, for him from eternity. And it was not until he breathed his last breath on the cross and cried out, consumatum est in Latin, it is finished, that all of his acts done throughout his life recapitulated themselves in him and were diffused for the betterment of all souls and creatures. Had Christ not finished that final act, all the other acts of his human existence would not be complete because they are all like double chains of light connected and they are unbroken. Remember in my previous uh, reflection, I shared with you that passage of Jesus to Louisa telling her that the acts done in his will form double chains of light. They form the strongest bonds that nothing can break. And that they are more powerful than a solar ray that one cannot extinguish. And if you don't remember where that quote is from, it is from volume 20, September 23rd, 1926. It is also found in volume 11, September 6th, 1913 where Jesus reminds Louisa that um, these double chains of light are the fruit of acts done in his will. And they are engendered also through the meditation on his passion that obtain for it, for Christ, love of incalculable value. So in these end times, my brothers and sisters in Christ, let us pray for one another. Let us ask God forgiveness for ourselves and for those who are complicit in evil. For their conversion, we pray. And we offer sacrifice. And we frequent the sacraments. And we establish a steadfast daily prayer life whereby we may be beacons of light to others in this dark night. So that forging forward without fright under God's might may experience heavenly delight. May God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.